Good afternoon, everyone. It's so good to see all of your faces this afternoon. I'm the Reverend Jill Olds, the director of the Youth Ministry Institute at Yale Divinity School. And the YMI is very pleased to welcome all of you to today's webinar entitled A Journey with LGBTQ Plus and Immigrant Youth with Mix Yadi Martinez Reina. I see some familiar faces and names in our group today, so welcome back to those of you who have been with us before. And a special welcome to all of you who are joining our community for the first time. We are so glad that you found your way to us. For our time today, Mix Martinez Reina will speak to us, then they will provide us with a brief workshop after which there will be some final time for questions. You will remain muted throughout, but we will be monitoring the chat window. So if you have a question, please feel free to type it in there at any time. Our office has a great staff and I'd like to just introduce them quickly and thank them for their work. The YMI falls under the purview of the Center for Continuing Ed at YDS. So we have Kelly Morrissey, the Managing Director of the Center. And we are blessed to have Megan Lukens, our Communications Coordinator. Thanks to both of you for your presence and for all of your hard work. If you're new to us, to the Youth Ministry Institute, we invite you to peruse our website when you get a free chance. That's YaleYouthMinistryInstitute.org. We have a whole array of resources on there, folks. We have curricula for your youth, training modules for youth leaders. We have a number of discussion forums, which if you register, you can then type in a question and we'll chat about it. We have over 800 video clips and lectures given, given by world's leading youth ministry experts. We have COVID era resources. We have tips for resilience with youth, resources for anti-racism, links to other articles and materials. There's a whole lot on there. It's a brand new website. All of the offerings are for free. So please do take some time to check us out there. We also want you to mark your calendars for upcoming events. Our theme for this year, as many of you know, is Not Your Mother's Youth Group, Ministry to Youth in 2021. With this in mind, our next offering will be uh, a month from today, Wednesday, March 3rd, also at 12 p.m., at which time we will welcome the Reverend Matt Overton. Reverend Overton will speak about youth ministry from an angle of social enterprise, which is a form of youth ministry that's being explored in pockets all over the country. People are finding success with this. So please do consider joining all of us then, Wednesday, March 3rd. A link to that registration can be found on our website, in our newsletter, and also in the chat window here. And now it's my deep pleasure to introduce all of you to Mix Yadi Martinez Reina. Mix Yadi Martinez Reina is a bilingual Latinx gender nonconforming artist. They are a UCC licensed minister, pastor, and borderlander. Born and raised in South Texas, Mix Martinez Reina serves as the LGBTQIA unconscious bias awareness facilitator. They have over 10 years of experience working with young people in the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. Yadi's work includes using arts and networking skills to create community events, retreats, leadership conference conferences, and as they will be talking about in a few minutes, safe spaces. They currently serve as a youth pastor at New Church, New, sorry, New Church Chiesa Nuova. UCC in Dallas, Texas, and at first UCC in Second Life, where they are part of a virtual reality congregation. Mix Martinez, Reina, thank you so much for being with us. We are honored to have you, and I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you for having me. I'm going to start this by sharing my screen and the presentation, and uh, I am just excited to be here. And I pray that my words and what I can share with you can be of inspiration and can help others out there. So I am going to share my screen now. Here we go. Uh, and can you see it? Thumbs up. All right, here we go. So uh, good morning and greetings from the Red Barn at Galileo Church in Kennedale, Texas. Now, I wish I could be in person with all of you, but uh, I believe that even from far away, we are in sacred space. So uh, welcome to a journey with LGBTQ youth and Latino immigrant youth. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Yari Martinez Reina and I am a borderlander. Uh, I was born and raised in the town of Brownsville, Texas, which borders with Matamoros, Mexico. 
uh, I have spent my life crossing bridges, either to Matamoros, to go to Mexico, to be with friends and family, or for the same purpose at Port Isabel at the Queen Isabella Crossway to go to the playa, so the island, okay? Um, who would have known that such a reality would be a metaphor for my journey with young people? Uh, as a young person, I was highly involved in ministry. And when I got older, I had to leave the church of my youth, the church I loved, and um, I felt, you know, it was no longer my home. So fast forward to finding hope and finding a place in the United Church of Christ that not only welcomed me, but also helped me rediscover my calling. And it's after this period of reconciliation that I realized how much I missed the church of my youth. And so I realized that despite the theological differences in the church, I learned to love God and I love people. And through my upbringing, I learned leadership skills and I had a community until I had to leave. So I started my journey working with young people and I knew that I wanted to share with them how wonderful my experiences in a community of faith was. But I struggled. At first, uh, I wanted to find a balance. I didn't want to be too religious, but I did want to be loving and I would, wanted to be affirming. And so through prayer and discernment, I realized that Jesus had a particular way of sharing the good news. The good news that showed him going out into the margins, asking questions, listening, giving, helping, loving, and even not understanding at times and readjusting his perspective. So how can I convince young people that have been hurt like I was, that had left the church, that we had a place for them? And how can I convince my people in the Latino community that the English congregation where I was loves them and that the youth group was also there for the Latino kids? How can I walk with youth who are immigrants, but then they're afraid to share their immigration status with me? And that is when a young man walked into the youth group one day and told me he had been asked to leave his church. And that's when the journey began. It turns out that LGBTQ and Latino youth want to help in the community. They want to go on mission trips. They want to participate in the life of the church. They want to do something. They need a community of faith that welcomes them and celebrates all of their gifts. So as pastors, as leaders, as activists, as youth ministers, or just plain fans of young people, we must create a bridge that young people can cross. Or perhaps you already built that bridge. But like me, young people don't know how to find it. They don't trust it. They're afraid of it. Might be afraid it crumbles halfway. So today, I share with you some testimonials, some narratives that have been a part of my life. In particular, the way that I've negotiated intersectionality in creating spaces where teens can find a sense of belonging. Creating a space for a young person who is often asked to leave other places is crucial. Even if it's only for a moment, a young person can find a safe space to get out of the elements, maybe a bad situation at home, maybe the streets, where they can find an authentic place that welcomes them without judgment. Teens need a place to find help with homework, with school projects, or just someone to help them with challenges. So I am deeply saddened when I hear the news that a young person has taken their life. According to the Trevor Project, Latinx youth worry a lot about themselves or a family member being detained or deported due to immigration status. This chart shows the statistics and how they are particularly at risk of attempting suicide. LGBT youth are faced with unsafe and unwelcoming behavior by students and sometimes other professors or people. And the national organizations like Lesson provides resources that helps us become allies of young people. So when I hear of a young person in despair, I often wonder if they know I wonder how we can let them know that there's so many of us, so many of us here and out there that are ready and willing and able to lend them a hand, to meet them halfway where they are, maybe all the way. And I wonder if they know that you and I have a vast network of people we know because we don't know everything, right? But we can find the answers and we can help them with resources. So through this workshop, 
I will share with you how it is possible to provide a place for young people that can also become an empowering force that can save their lives. So I will share with you a formula that has worked for me. I'm part of both LGBT and Latino communities. And so that helps me walk among them. But even then I had some, you know, issues sometimes connecting, reaching young people. And so I learned that I needed to build a structure, a solid ground. And second, I needed to build the bridges that connected with network and resources. And third, then I could start building the blocks and I can help them out. The questions and the key elements that surround this formula guided my theological understanding, my practical commitment in creating a place that goes out into the margins. My hope is that by sharing these testimonials with you, I can spark your imagination and I can provide maybe new ideas. As I go through this presentation, I will offer a moment of reflection because together in this group, we can benefit from a dialogue. And at the end, you might have some ideas I haven't thought about. So I'm excited to share this with you. So the first thing is, how do we create a space for young people who are not already here? We build it, we create it, we enhance it, we rethink it. And we start this by asking ourselves a few questions. Who is missing at the table? And is your place somewhere that our young people can learn to evolve into their own identity? Do they have permission to discover who they are? What are your nonverbals in your space? Seems like a lot of questions, right? But the truth is that only you can think about your space and only you can honestly answer these questions. Who is missing at the table? Well, we need to be honest and ask, can the people get to the table? Who do I imagine sitting with my teens and with me? Now, I have often heard pastors and ministers say, but Yadi, I don't have fill in the blank youth. Actually, you might have fill in the blank youth. You might just not know it. Maybe they might not be sure they can tell you who they are just yet. Or perhaps they have friends, but they're not sure if they can invite them in. So we'll start with some really basic terms. Safe space. A safe space is a space designed for any young person to feel welcome, accepted, validated, celebrated, regardless of their disability, race, or their gender identity. Safety is on the minds of Latinos who are immigrants, and they're not sure how much personal information they can share with you. Do we ask for identification? Do we ask too many personal questions? People often wonder when they give out this information, especially if they're immigrants, if you're putting it on a database. Where is that database? Who's gonna see the database? And if it's mission trips or other areas that you'll be traveling, well, be aware that in the United States, there are often border patrol checkpoints, especially in the south of Texas. So if you have Latino teens who are not going on some of the trips, we have to ask ourselves, is it money or are they concerned from where we're going? Brave space. A brave space is designed for a young person to learn to respectfully express themselves without the fear of shaming, name calling or ridicule. Regarding space, what are the jokes or games that we play? Some of the teens that face bullying are ridicule and hurt I shared at the beginning of this presentation, the suicide statistics. So we have to be careful that we treat things in our youth center with respect. So how do we handle kids picking at each other? Do we say boys will be boys? And how do you handle someone being called weird? Or what is weirdly acceptable? How are your teens actively welcoming people? I have a friend who told me that she has a small little rainbow sticker on her classroom door. That's a little symbol that says, yes, I'm an ally. I usually use name tags for events. My name is, my preferred gender pronoun is. It's a small thing perhaps, but it goes a long way to showing people this is a safe, brave space where you could be comfortable, you could be celebrated. Again, you know, 
What will other teens say? How would they react or respond? And so a way to establish a safe and brave space is by talking with your teens. What can we agree upon? In church terminology, we use the words covenant. In the nonprofit world, we might say policies, guidelines. Ask what are your non-negotiables? Then share your ideas and your thoughts with the youth, but ask them to agree and add to your initial comments. And if they disagree, ask them to maybe help you write it in another way. The point is that if they are a part of these policies, then all would be respectful and create this respectful affirming environment by young people for young people. Now, let me show you um, this next picture. The goal here was to become an inclusive space for LGBT youth. There were no LGBT teens and Latinos never showed up, okay? This was something, a new place I had come to and although it was in the community, there was no kids. So I put some flags up, okay? And one of the things that came to my attention was that the straight kids wanted a flag too. So I had to go order a banner because evidently I couldn't find a straight flag. And it must be silly, I know, but it was important that all teens felt represented. They wanted a flag, we made a flag. The fact is young people need to realize that they're not that different when it comes to dreams, to aspirations, to life challenges. Now, when it comes to the Latino youth, more than often they won't join the English group. So how do you create that bridge? Well, you must emphasize that your events and your mission trips and any major logistic planning needs, needs them at the table as one group. I understand perhaps for logistic on Sunday mornings, you might have two different groups and there is value in groups being separated, providing cultural places to belong and that's essential, yes? But on significant events and on trips, come together as one group. As a Latin person, I often felt that I got leftovers and it wasn't meant that way, but people would say, here, we had this leftover from our event. Uh, so think about that. Are the Latino youth in part of the planning or are they an afterthought? In terms of space, we think about the differences between the groups. Where do you meet? Where do they meet? And when it comes to connecting both groups, it was essential for me to realize that our congregation was one, but we had two different cultures, ultimately one body, yes? And so how do we bridge this gap? Well, you might reach out to the Latino pastor and ask them to join you on these events, or you visit them and you connect with their community. So when I held a confirmation classes, I asked the Latino pastor to join us to talk about communion. And we both decided that it was in the best interest of our youth group to hold one communion worship that I would lead for both groups through the whole year. Now, our English friends came to realize that us Latinos, we go all out when it comes to confirmation and celebration. I mean, look at this clothing. We had to look wonderful. We had tamales. We had all kinds of food. I'm getting hungry just thinking about this. But in the church setting, this is what one body looks like. This is intersectionality at its best. So again, think about what you have around, how it connects in your context. And so now I wanna talk about bridging the gap with community events and networking. Two events that you can easily be a part of is the Day of Silence that Blessing organizes. And you can go to the website and sign up your group. And you can also hold a Break in the Silence party afterwards. There's a Spirit Day that is the same thing. It's for anti-bullying. And there are two quick events that you can easily organize just to bring awareness to your youth group and to also let them know that you are a place where people can come. But often I ended up visiting homeless shelters and places, youth homeless shelters and places where I can find resources for youth and all that. Now I know at that time I didn't have teens who needed these resources. 
But going to youth homeless shelters, I found out that they hosted holiday parties. And some of them had dinner, uh, Friday dinner for, for youth. And so I was able to take our youth and I was able to show them a new perspective. And they were able to meet students their age and teens their age. And then those teens would hear about us. So part of a, the let them know we're here campaign was to partner in events in the community that were also going on. So National Hispanic Day, Cesar Chavez Day, but one of the events that I hosted, I hosted three events, and one of them was Gobble to You Wobble. With the help of our network, by partnering with organizations, the community, and other teens, we gathered gift packs. The gift packs had toiletries, raffle tickets, and we raffled bus tickets and all kinds of gifts through the night. With the help of congregation and other fans of young people, we gathered turkeys, sight meals, really cool stuff. And we reached out to the youth homeless shelter and other places that work with teens in the streets, and we gave them an open invitation. So we hosted even a drag show, PG-13. And this was a wonderful night where we were just able to bring kids to just have fun. We also provided a comprehensive list of local resources and services outside of our place that included phone numbers and other national hotlines. All this information was also posted outside our youth room, just in case, right? One of my favorite yearly events that we held was a teen prom. At this event, we created a place for teens to arrive early and with the help of our network and calling some friends of mine. We had people doing hair, makeup, nails. We also had people donate dress, shirts, cool stuff uh, that kids could have. And on that night, for those who couldn't afford a prom, got to go to a prom with their date. And it was a wonderful evening, a safe place for all, right? In the summer, we hosted a teen pride outside. And we even had a stage for teens to come perform. We had all kinds of activities. And I asked the Latino parents, Please help me do some loteria, some water of horchata, some cool stuff. I want everybody in the neighborhood to know we're here, right? And everybody who came felt they were seen. So here's the deal. In everything we do, we must be careful that we have the best interest of these teens we serve in mind. And so therefore, any volunteers who joined us at the event, their organizations partner with us and they provided information, a copy of their names and a current background check. So that is important to keep in mind. Now, one of the things I have in my toolbox, maybe because I work security at a shopping center with teens all over, but I learned that there must be careful planning and scheduling. And one of the things that helped me was to learn how to overlap volunteers, volunteers who are fresh, clear-minded and ready to smile. Plus, everyone enjoys a time at the event without neglecting specific tasks. So you had people kind of taking care of uh, each other. It was great. And so having a fresh set of eyes, rested hearts, really helps moving things along. And plus, as a leader, you need to have a bird's eye view, right? You need to be able to see things, make sure everyone's good, things are moving along, but above all, you need to be able to go do the wobble. You need to be out there, right? So it's important also to have a team that does not mind acting silly sometimes, right? So I want every young person that comes in to feel like a guest and in time, like family. I want them to know how valuable they are by the way we treat them with respect, with integrity, generosity. So every person that volunteers must be a fan of young people but they must also keep in mind respecting boundaries. Adult volunteers must have friends their age because as adults, they're leaders, mentors, allies, and who know that it's essential to maintain healthy boundaries. So I ask you to please develop an interview process that goes beyond a background check. I'm telling you this because young people face power dynamics and they do not always know when someone is using them. So trust your instincts. As adults, we rejoice and we expect nothing in return when we see youth join us and have fun. But friends can be, these teens can be vulnerable friends, right? 
Some of these teens lack resources. Street teens in particular can be intimidated to keep a secret. So we must be careful not to open the doors to regrettable possibilities. Remember that in everything we do, we do no harm. So here's another thing. Not everyone can do youth work, right? Not everyone wants to be with the youth, but part of my volunteers were behind the scenes. These were youth uh, workers that I would say, you wanna come work with youth? And I'd be like, no, no. But they were actually great volunteers and they were my best researchers and most administrative support that I could ever have. People who could poke holes into my logistics plan and help me be better prepared. But they did not set one foot anywhere near teens and that was okay. Now, because of the events that we held, we attracted young people who at first I had no idea they were not part of the congregation. I also moved between the youth center and the youth ministry with so much ease that I was unaware and unsure that some teens that started at the church came to the youth center, some kids at the youth center came to the church. I, I lost track. So one day while teaching about Jesus feeding the crowds, a teen pointed out that he was hungry. Although the student said it as a joke, I realized he was talking beyond the box of donuts. But I also knew that they were not gonna ask me for anything if they could avoid it, especially in front of other kids. So the way I went around this was I invited them to come join me at the food pantry or for breakfast at Saturday morning where we held uh, breakfast. And it was easier to talk about things there when they didn't feel pressured by other teens. And as they were joining me for breakfast and as they were joining me to help out in the pantry, they were able to see that we had things for them and that they could take things home with them. It just really helped out. So another thing that I realized later on was that we had teens waiting outside for us to open the doors. At lock-ins, I often find myself looking for paper. Where is the paperwork on this teen? <laughs> I have no, they didn't have parents. I had no idea where they came from. So you might wonder, how could I miss that some of these teens were not part of the congregation? Well, here's the thing. Teens are good at hiding things. And they're good at hiding sometimes if they don't have a stable home. Teens are good at couch surfing. They stay with friends. They have sleepovers. They sleep in couches here and there. And some join sports that have showers, and lockers, and free meals at school. So some are homeless and some are not. Some rather just not go home. Either way, you're not going to know about it until they want to share with you. So as we started opening earlier, we started having different programming, but just games to play. And I realized this was an opportunity to connect. So our scheduling involved now pre-service, post-service, mid-service. And at one point we had a team come in and play the guitar in the background. So we were having like a jam session with typical cafe hangout, playing chess and all kinds of stuff. Here's the deal. If you're there for the cool stuff and silly things, then they will know they can speak to you about serious things. So when they reach out, they know they can trust you because you're there. And they know that you really miss them when they're not. If you have a large youth ministry, it's easy to miss them. But if you have volunteers around, it can help you keep track of them. So your team is important. Look for those who might be amazing behind the scenes. In church, we call them your prayer warriors. In nonprofit, we call them your amazing researchers. And in real life, I needed both. So think about your area and who can be your backup and your support. One day while well, I was on Facebook, because Facebook is you know awesome, right? And I found this article that said 13 things that successful kids have in common. And I posted them here. And so being a parent, I wanted to make sure that I was following this cool formula. And I particularly enjoy reading number three. They have high expectations. They value effort over failure. I feel pretty good. My kid is good, right? But then I realized not every teen has a parental figure. Parents are often stressed. And it's possible that sometimes teens just won't talk, right? And I thought further about this. 
the young people on the streets, the LGBTQ youth, the immigrant youth that maybe don't know how to communicate with parents, who teaches them social skills, high expectations, who teaches them to value effort over failure. Sometimes we're the best next person. And so we strive to teach young people to listen and we show them to solve problems. We do a lot of grace-based coaching, right? And I often tell leaders not to be surprised when a team acts out. Out, that doesn't mean that we say, ah, oh, pobrecito, poor kid, he's had a bad life, right? We give him a pass. No, that just means that we give them grace with understanding where they realize that some consequences can have lasting effects on them. We teach them how to roll with things. We teach them that mistakes happen. We teach them that things happen, but we're always there to help them see a new perspective that hopefully won't hurt their future, their dreams, as well as others. And so through all those challenges, teens need to know that they're still seen and that regardless of mistakes, we still value them. A young person said to me, the fact that you would ask me how I was doing validated my self-worth. Something so simple. LGBTQ immigrant youth, uh, they have statistics, right? And they're really crappy. Sometimes teens in the streets have to negotiate all these different things. So when we talk to them, we, you know, we try to tell them how to avoid a record. We try to help them, but we also try to celebrate the resilience, their accomplishment, no matter how small they are. And we create programming that contributes to their growth. In the events we had, I would always reach out to teens that I knew liked the arts or logistics or any of that, right? We had teens who wanted to learn to do sound and they did. They ran the sound, the lighting, the media. We reached out to teens who loved art. They came up with a theme, a poster, a design. We also had introvert teens. Don't forget the introvert teens, trust me. Uh, but they're mathematical, analytical geniuses. And I would often tell them to help me do a budget. Before anything made it to our behind the scenes team, these teens already had a part in the creation and the brainstorming. So to create programming that contributes to their growth, we think about ways to empower them. We look at our network. We find ways to show them opportunities to help them dream. Once a quarter, we had different classes. We gave them a space to learn from people who had excellent skills. For example, I have a degree in design and media, and so I was always excited to teach teens to do some design work or to do some video editing work. And I have a friend who donated his time teaching people to film. So soon enough, we had our teens doing commercials. Today, we have just so much awesome technology at our fingertips. They're just geniuses with these phones. And so we try to use these skills because they come in handy for you to promote things. They come in handy for events, for trips. It's your own media, social media team. That's awesome. I also had a friend who was a chef. So I had him come in and teach some cooking classes and all of this planning and all of these cooking helps because on mission trips, you might get more than mac and cheese, right? We all know that we need to think about our budget and the games we play and the media we play and all of that. And so if teens get to be a part of it, they make things happen. If they're at the wheel with planning and everything, they not only show up, but they bring friends with them. So I thought that was pretty cool. At a youth center, teens wanted to do a fashion show. Yes, a fashion show. So the teens had to come up with a budget and we worked through some logistics. The teens had a hand in everything, okay? Now the adult volunteers, we had to reach out in our networks and make phone calls because we needed people who were willing to come and teach them to sew and bring their sewing machines. So we had aspiring artists who wanted to learn to design clothing. So we reached out to an art school and we had them come in and talk to them. And we had promoters, right? Uh, we had drag queens come in and talk about makeup and, and how to walk. These are important skills. Uh, we had logistics. 
We had uh, people that had to research where the show would be. How much is it going to cost? How much is it going to be for the tickets? Where are we going to have this event? And what are the additional things that we might need, like entertainment? What do you mean we need a food permit? So these were all important things that teens sometimes don't think about. Um, and so until the day of the event, the volunteers we hold our breath, we're like, is this thing going to work? We called uh, a lot of people. We reach into a Rolodex. See what I did that? Or, or okay. So we call people and we said, "Come, you have to show up to this thing because the kids really put an effort in it." And it was great. It was a success. The best thing is looking at their faces. These are immigrant youth and LGBT youth that maybe would have never thought of a fashion show, but there they were. They made it happen, and they knew that with us behind them, cheering. They could do anything. Some of these teens have gone to art school. Some are performers. Some are RuPaul Drag Race 13. Now, let me tell you, let me throw you a curveball though. How can we help young people without becoming enablers? How can we help them to think for themselves? And that's by keeping it real, okay? Youth, young people need to be agents of change. They need to learn how to use resources, they need to learn how to make decisions. I have lost track of time of how many miracles have happened when youth find cell phones in the street, really cool cell phones. So I know that they can get what they want if they really search and want it, right? But they're also, they also come across disappointments. And it takes another person to help them see a different angle, a different perspective. So we need to help them put together a puzzle. Gustavo Gutierrez said it best, the opposite of liberation is oppression, originated out of dependence, subordination. Dependence means that life's material conditions are so limited the free subjectivity of human beings cannot be developed. Sometimes oppression seems too hard. Life is so difficult and no one can see a way out for young people it is sometimes difficult to see past tomorrow. And so we asked them to write things down, to work through ideas where we can help them figure things out. And I wanna make those phone calls for them and I wanna, I wanna fix things for them. But early in my career, I learned that I can't always do that. See, I had a young person who had an addiction. Addictions are hard. And without a solid plan in place, no matter how much a teen promises to leave the addiction and how much you wanna just give and give, the addiction wins. So I learned to ask questions. I learned to ask them to spell things out and ask them to tell me what is getting in your way of achieving your goal. And friends, I, I have a formula that's worked for me, but I don't have a mold that fits each student, right? So as a good artist, I offer them clay and water. You build, and if it doesn't look right, you gotta build again, you gotta start again. I can't do it for them, but as a good art teacher, I listen and I guide them and I hope that they can see past the mess and create things. As a Latinx person, I'm gonna share with you also a conversation that I've had with parents regarding college. Because a lot of times we say, well, if they go to college to get an education, you know, things are gonna be great, right? But some Latinos cannot see a future in academia. My Latino son has never had to worry about anything because even though one of his parents is an immigrant, we work hard and we wanted him to go to college. And so since the beginning, we've been, we've been pushing, right? But other Latinos have different challenges, especially immigrant youth who are not born here. And they do not always have a DACA status that helps them see a college future. Some who were born here still don't see the possibility of college. A parent once told me, as soon as my teen turns 18, they gotta get to work. This parent said, at 18, the school doesn't bother me and the authorities can't tell me anything. From 16 part-time to 18 full-time, the teen needs to get to work. And the family needed all the help they could get. I had another Latino parent who said, I do want my kid to go to college, but that's for rich people. That, 
That's not for us. I went to technical school and community college, and it's taken me forever where I am today. I'm about to graduate with my master's, and it has seemed like a lifetime, seriously. But I had to do a lot of working, and I had to apply for a lot of scholarships, and it was possible. It is possible, but I can't paint the pretty picture. All I could do is tell them the facts, some of the things that help. I can't say, you know, get your bootstraps and pull it up because some kids don't have boots, right? But what we could do is help them provide and see the possibilities. We remember stories. We share with them how other people have made it or succeeded. We show them different angles. We bring different perspectives. We have to counterbalance some of the negative influences that they might hear because sometimes the media or people might not have their best interests in mind. We also want to help parents see that it might be a little harder, but we could do it. Si se puede, right? So the thing is that teens deserve a seat at the table, especially when it comes to their future, right? And part of what makes things successful is that we involve them in these skills of learning. So one of the things that made our youth um, center successful was that we had a youth board. Some, some youth love to talk and they know everything because some are like awesome, right? And so we wanted them to use those skills and uh, we taught them some Robert rule of orders. Can't believe some of those kids actually read those things. They knew more than we did sometimes, but they, we, we taught them how to vote. We had, some had campaign managers, it happens. And we, uh, in the church, we had youth ambassadors, yes, because it was important for them to, to learn how to negotiate. And so we had a youth board, we had youth ambassadors. Um, they, they went to board meetings, they participated in other stuff. We taught them how to negotiate, how to review evaluations that came in from every event, because it's important to evaluate what you're doing. And at the end of the year, they got a letter that said, here are your volunteer hours and you're an amazing leader. Here's your letter of recommendation. And at the annual dinner, they got to talk to donors and they got to speak to others. And at board meetings, they got to um, stand up and speak. So it was awesome. It was amazing. The fact that they were, um, they were, cause they're grownups, youth are, you know, they're, they're adults, right? And so we taught them some leadership skills. So um, we wanted the best interest in mind for them. So one of the things that, um, that I wanna talk about is that at, at this point, because of COVID and all, we're not meeting in person, right? And it's hard to stay connected with our youth at this time. But one of the things that we've been doing is we've been able to connect through two different mediums, two different things. We have uh, discord.com where uh, they're able to connect to a network and we're able to leave chat and all kinds of, uh, you're able to put channels on. And then we have this thing called gather town where they're also able to go in and they're able to um, see each other on camera and move their little thing around. It's really cool. And I wanted to talk about these things, like just offer you this, cause this is how we're doing right now with youth ministry. This is how we're doing right now, um, the different things. Um, our youth leaders or youth mentors are part of this. They're still connected uh, to our teens. We have this open thing where everyone can continue to um, be together even though we're apart. And so I wanted to share that with you. Immigrant youth, Latino youth, LGBT youth, they can be successful. They can find a place where they can learn skills. They need mentors. They need people like you and me who have the opportunity and the ability to show them that things are possible. A lot of them might not see it right off the bat, but if they, if they could just see the stuff that you do, if they can just connect to the things you already have, if they can just feel like they're a part of things, um, they will also see the value you see in them. They will see that they are important. They will see that they have a future. They would also see that no matter what happens, they're safe, they're okay, they got you. And that's the best way to be practical about the fact that they also got God. 
and that is a sacred space and a sacred place where everyone can just be one body, one family, we can be together. And so I hope that some of these ideas and some of these testimonials and some of these um, information that I've, that I've given can um, help you in some way in your context. So thank you. Yadi, thank you so much for all that you're, all that you've shared with us. This is incredibly beneficial and helpful. I have a, a couple of questions that have arisen in the chat, and folks, if you have questions, please feel free to to drop some there. Um, a, a couple questions, Yadi. So, can you say a bit about the faith formation pieces that you've brought in? Because I know you and I talked about that before about some of the some of the theological pieces that very obviously undergird everything you have done with your youth. What are the, where are the, um, the doors into teaching those to youth and bringing it front and center for them? Yeah, for confirmation, one of the things that I noticed is that if I uh, brought in books and all that, they, they would panic. The kids would look at me like, oh no, we got homework. So one of the things that I, that I was able to connect with all of that was how to bring guests in, how to connect some of what we were doing with activities. Um, instead of having uh, where we would meet an hour after church, we would have a Saturday sort of mini retreat where we would have lesson presentation, some activity, some excitement and dinner together. We always concluded with a dinner together. And by doing that, I kept reaffirming the fact that our confirmation and all of we're doing in this is the fact that we're one body, that we're one faith community, that we're all together in this. And by making it practical, by making it a part of some of the activities. When we came to talk about the Trinity, we came to talk about God, we came to talk about Jesus, we would go and purposely say, okay, this week we're gonna go to a youth center, or this week we're gonna go to a homeless shelter. We're gonna connect what we're doing with what we're teaching. And so that was, um, especially in confirmation, because it took so long, about almost about a year. And so what it did, it's, it really created these, these connections also with our pastors, because we would ask them to come in and be, uh, come play with us some whirly ball and come play with us some other stuff and just come hang out because then the youth got to meet the pastors of the church. And it didn't seem like there was this, this pastor way up there. This person was having dinner with them. This person was coming in. And we had all these different pastors coming in and interacting. So I try to make it as practical as I can when it comes to these lessons. Yeah, I appreciate that a lot. And your mentioning of the pastors raises something else for me. I and mean, your situation is really unique in that you had both the youth center and the youth ministry at the church, and they were kind of like flowing one from the other, it sounds like, which is, is super interesting. My wondering is how connected was your youth program to the wider church body? Um, demographically, were those two groups pretty similar? Were they really different? Um, how did you work to build that bridge so that the church owned the program itself? Yeah, so um, one of the, we had what we called high church. Uh, part of that was that so we had um, the lay ministers of worship, they would come in and they would have the candles and, and the Bible and they would do the whole processional and all that jazz. So part of the confirmation uh, was to practice how to be lay ministers of worship. So we had the lay ministers of worship come in and teach them how to do everything. And uh, measuring some of the youth and wearing robes was like, I would never wear this outside of this place. Um, and it was really funny seeing them get dressed and and then having practicing this. And some of these kids were so embarrassed, like people are gonna be looking at me. Um, and so we wanted them to feel connected with the church programming. For Christmas, we asked them who loves, like, so who likes to sing? And so we were able to connect with the choir and ask them if they could come and sing for Christmas for the choir. And some of these, some of these, um, especially the LGBT youth or immigrant youth who are, who are like, so often they feel like we just don't fit in. We don't have the clothes for that. We don't. And so we would say, well, you don't have to worry about it. We're wearing robes. We're all dressing up. It's all good. We got this. And so they wouldn't feel pressured. Like I have to dress really nice to go to a Christmas party or a Christmas celebration. 
And so by having, um, by having them with the choir, by having them connected with the lay ministers worship, uh, by having them connected with the food pantry, which is also part of the church or um, the breakfast we had also, they got to meet facilities, they got to meet other folks and they got to be a part of the church. Yeah, and you mentioned a mentor program at one point too. What, what did that look like? So some of our behind the scene um, team members were teachers and they're like, I work with kids all day long. I am not coming in and working with, with kids anymore. And so I would ask them what some, what are some of the mentors program that we could put together? And uh, you don't have to do anything. Um, we'll, we'll gather some other volunteers. And so we, one of the things we put together was a GD program and a SAT program um, things like that. Uh, some of the students that wanted to go to college but didn't know how, um, we asked them, you know, could you provide us some research, some things that other person, uh, other youth uh, volunteers who wanted to be a part of the mentoring program could come in on Saturdays and that would be the purpose of some of our Saturday things. So just as we had chefs coming in and teaching about cooking, we also had people who said, you know, kids need to learn how to change the oil. A lot of these kids are turning 18, they have a car and they never change the oil. And so we had a gentleman from the church who would come in and say, I want to mentor kids how to change oil and take care of their cars. Uh, that was important to him. So there, we had the main mentors, the main people who were committed to this program. And, but they were also able to connect with the sub-network sub of people in the church to, to try to teach or to implement some things. I love that because it sounds like, you know, it, there are a lot of, you're, you're giving us a treasure trove of different ideas of activities and things like that. But underneath all of that is also these really important life skills that the youth might not get elsewhere that you're implementing for them. It sounds like the church was really embracing uh, walking with people through their entire lives, right? Like our, our whole lives, like just being with people in that way, which is really special. Yeah, yeah. All right, I have a question. So you mentioned the blocks and you had, a, you had a whole bunch on there with different words. Of those blocks, what are the, some that you have built that you can highlight for us? You know, is there one or two that you found to be especially relevant with LGBTQ youth or with immigrant youth, either or both? Yeah, um, so healthy habits is really difficult for us grownups. And so one of the blocks was about how to be uh, aware of your own um, healthy habits. And so I highlight the, the awareness, the self-help, but also the resilience. And to say, oh my God, you are in the streets. You are such a resilient person. You are such a uh, successful person. And they would look at me and say, I live under a bridge sometimes I don't have a bed. How am I a successful person? And I said, because every day you wake up and every day you work hard to get to another place. So that makes you resilient. How do I get healthy habits when I live out here? You pay attention to the different ways that you can take care of yourself out there. You reach out to places that can help you. And so that's very important for uh, kids who feel that they are disregarded and they feel, so once a student said to me, I feel how I look. And I said, well, let's change that. Um, I've gone shopping with them at thrift stores and said, I, we could dress fancy in this place for $5. You know, um, and I've had people come in and say, um, what are you missing? What do you need? And have them donate it to the church, not to the youth specifically, because then I don't want them to feel like they own someone, um, but they'll donate to the church fund. And then we were able to go thrift store shopping. So, and, and the reason we did thrift store shopping as opposed to any other fancy places is because that is what they have. That is where they can walk in from the streets and, and dress up um, mock interviews and things like that. So. That's super helpful. Yeah, thank you. Someone sent us a message asking if you could talk about using art with preteens and teenagers. Uh, this person is saying, I'm looking for activities beyond typical Sunday school crafts. So yeah, anything yeah. along those lines. So Lent's coming up. Um, I think, yes, Lent's coming up. <laughs> with Zoom, we've lost track of so many, all these places, all these times, right? But Lent's coming up. And so um, 
how do we create so some spiritual habits? Um, prayer, uh, so uh, we would do some prayer beats. So how can we create that? Um, uh, how can we use um, the candles, the Volto candles with the batteries? How can, with the batteries, because I've had issues with, okay. So how can we create those little battery candles and how can we create like, so it looks really cool. Basically, how can you get simple things and, and make it then to where your space can be a sacred space that they built? So that's one of them. Uh, another thing we've done with art is we put a, um, a plywood because some churches would have issues with you going crazy on the wall. So we would put a plywood on the wall and we would paint it white and then we created a mural. Um, you know, the best way to do is the old school projector. Um, that we, we would get and we would draw, we would come up with something, then we would draw it and then they would come in and we would paint it in, in sections or in blocks. That was one of them. Um, another thing was that by them being able to sign around the stuff, they had something to do with basically creating their space. That's one of them. Um, one of my favorite things that I did was uh, uh, pallets. Uh, you know, you try to get some pallets and then you sand them and you can create furniture with them. And, and it takes more skills and stuff like I had someone come in and actually do the saw cutting and stuff like that. And uh, some kids wanted to learn about it, but just got to be really nervous sometimes. Uh, with preteens, it was the coloring of the painting, the creating. Um, and if you want to go beyond crafts, you start working with clay um, and also just creating sacred items and spaces. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, shifting gears slightly, uh, you mentioned the unique situation that certain youth hold in their fear of being detained or deported. Mm -hmm. How are pastors or youth workers called to be present to the very reasonable fear that that particular community of youth hold? So the first thing we need to ask is if their congregation is a safe sanctuary uh, place. Uh, um, sanctuary, uh, if they like, so I know it's some UCC uh, congregations have become sanctuary uh, community. So um, the, I call it border patrol, but it's uh, Homeland Security, I believe it's called now. Um, but I was, I was raised around the border patrol, always around us, this is what we call them, border patrol, but Homeland Security, there's some places where they cannot get to, right? And so is your church one of those places? And if it is, um, is it known in the in the in the community or in the congregation? The kids know this, um, because that that's super important just to kind of have behind your cart that um, you can go there and you're going to be safe. Um, and with kids, and that fear of I'm going to be detained, I'm going to be deported, I'm going to show up to home tomorrow, and my parents are going to be gone, uh, and then what's going to happen? So I had a mother whose real fear was that if she got deported. That her kids are we're just going to be at home alone, right? And so in our conversation, I said, well, if that happens, who is the next person that could help you with your kids or can take care of your kids? Who can we call? And it's such a dark uh, conversation sometimes. It's almost like when you talk about when I die, I want this done, right? It's so heavy. Um, but with prayer and with the communication and the conversation of we just want to make sure that we have this this backup this support that we can give you if this happens um i had a a student or a, or a parent who the student called me and said i think my mom got detained and i'm so scared i don't know what to do and so i went to the school and um i picked the student up i was on the list to pick them up the parent had done had left my name there um, it turns out the parent was just working late, but there was that fear that um, mom never picked me up. The, but the reality was I had got the phone call if I could help out, right? And so having that support of having a backup information, knowing what resources can be provided, um, do we have special counselors? Uh, do we have special um, people in the community who are lawyers or who can help us talk through some of these things? so that when we talk with these students or when we talk with these parents, we sort of know what we're talking about. Um, like I had no idea how DACA work. And so I had to do some research um, regarding that. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Question here about uh, language. So how do we help teenagers use and understand a language that is welcoming for 
all people, right? Um, a covenant is a great thing to develop, but how do we, um, it's kind of a part two part of the question, but how do we then enforce the covenant, right? When the covenant gets broken, when the space is no longer brave or safe, what does, what does helping youth in this process in their lives look like? Yeah, um, so I was talking about this congregation when I first came in, they were part of the LGBT community, but there was no LGBT youth, which was really weird, but it was, you know, it's just the way it was, right? And so um, at first, especially when you introduce the, uh, the name badges, which that is, a, there is a, that is a really important thing to do the name badges because, um, but, but before you do it, you have to talk about it, right? And so before we introduced them, a lot of them were like, them, that, like that is just grammatically wrong. And so, um, so we had to have a conversation about, I know, so maybe we could use something else. Like maybe if you're not comfortable saying they, them, theirs, uh, maybe we could just use their name. Uh, or instead of uh, he, him, maybe we should say person or people or students or like in, where you generalize it. And so it is difficult uh, because it's not something you're doing every day, right? Uh, but what worked for me was having them sit down together to come up with this covenant in the first place. But part of also coming up with this covenant was what do we do if we break it? And how do we say we've broken it and that we're uncomfortable? Um, like how do we call someone out without making it weird or uncomfortable? And so in one of our classes, they came up with the, the peace sign. And so somebody would say something that was totally off and somebody would just raise the peace sign and, and they would just do this. And then sometimes others wouldn't see it, but I would, and I'd be like, all right, all right, it's getting out of hand, let's bring it back. Uh, and sometimes I would miss it because I, I really didn't think it was uncomfortable, but someone raised the peace sign. And so we came up with, with, that, with that thing. Um, some other person said, well, we can come up with, with my heart. I can touch my heart, like, like that hurt. Um, and so they started in time, they started noticing these these call outs and, and them calling each other out work wonders. Yeah, I think oftentimes the youth get this before we adults do, right? So that doesn't, for some reason, surprise me too much. Yeah, I love the idea about the peace or the heart sign though, because it, it takes more sometimes for someone to speak it. But if you can just do one of these or one of these, it's, it's not it's not as much of a, um, a scary step, I think. It, it's, it's a little bit less frightening, yeah. yeah. All right, um, what is particular to the space, to the safe and the brave space that LGBTQ plus youth actually need? You know, uh, all youth need safe space, brave space, but I think that subset of our groups really needs that in a different way. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I wish the time would come where we wouldn't even have to address it because everyone in the room would feel like they belong. And so when it comes to LGBT youth, they are used to being called names. They are used to being disregarded. When it comes to immigrant youth, they are used to being invisible. So changing the dynamics of including them in decision-making, including them in planning, um, celebrating the bravery of dressing up differently or uh, things like that. I had, uh, I had a youth leader who knew that, a, that one of the students was going through a hard time and with, with, with his hair, he was losing his hair and something was happening. So the youth leader actually went and shaved his head. And I was like, well, that is brave. And he said, well, I just want him to know that it's okay. So I often say to, to youth leaders or in, or in training, you don't have to go shave your hair. Like this doesn't mean it, but um, you will find a way or your youth leaders. And, and I say that people that work with youth must be fans of young people because I really do believe that the spirit bugs us and that the spirit kind of just kind of nudges at us sometimes. And so everyone needs to have a place where they're loved, where they belong, where they're important where they are valued. But these particular um, groups, more than anything, need to know that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who or how you identify, you are just as important as the other person in this room. 
And that's why I say that, what are your nonverbals? And what, what is your body language? And there's been some stories that kids have told me where I would be like, oh my God, but I can't say it, right? Um, and then later on, I would ask them to speak and, you know, aside. And then I would say, I don't know, that's a great idea. Um, not in a confrontation or what are you thinking, but more of a, you know, maybe we could look at it this way. Um, so not treating them as aliens or as different, which aliens, not using the words illegal aliens. Um, so language, due diligence, and um, planning, purpose, pur purposely planning programming. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Similar question for immigrant youth. Um, what are the unique challenges to serving that community? And what uh, you mentioned about the deportation and being detained fears and the, the trauma that's associated with that. I guess I'm wondering if there is if there's more to the story there that folks should be mindful of. Yeah, uh, when I first started working or uh, being a part of the youth center volunteering it didn't occur to me that in that same demographic was immigrant youth. It just didn't occur to me. Um, and, and I don't know why, because it's, you know, we're everywhere, right? But it, it didn't occur to me that some of the students were not participating in some events because of fear. And, and so I mentioned that in, in the terms of trips and things like that, um, because I had a trip planned to South Texas and um, one of the parents said, well, is there any border patrol checkpoints? And, and then that's why I mentioned them. Um, but it hadn't occurred to me that the student that would have gone to with me to Matamoros to go work with the um, immigrants around the border, which was a great idea, um, was actually gonna jeopardize some of the students that were gonna go with me. Um, so that's important. Also, some of the immigrant youth that I've worked with, and like I said, I, I don't know why I didn't think that they were in the center, would come to me and say, um, am I gonna need an ID if we're gonna go to this event? Um, are you gonna need to see my ID? Um, wh what do you mean you're signing me up? Where, where's that going? Is, is someone gonna know where we live? And, and at first I didn't think about it, like what is, the, what is the fear of this? And until it was brought to my attention, well, if you put that somewhere on a database, will will the government know about us? And if they run us, or, I mean, and is it really, is the government really gonna run a specific student or a specific parent? Probably not. But to them, that was really important. That was really um, a fear of where their information was going and who, who were we sharing this information with? Yeah, no, that's, that's really salient, thank you. Just got another question from um, a person in the group here uh, who says, my biggest concern around LGBTQS plus teens right now is how I help them online when they're already finding isolation difficult. Uh, we talk, and this person is sharing, we talk during check-in on how to stay mentally healthy, but after a year of this, it's running thin. We're all tired of being online with school and virtual programs and platforms being pretty exhausting. Mm -hmm. What can we do for our youth? Yeah, definitely. I shared the Discord um, network because yes, uh, even right now with my own youth group, I started noticing a decline in, in uh, participation. And that's because you are just tired, screen tired. I think this is a new term. You're just screen tired. Uh, and some of the parents would tell me, well, on Sundays, we just want to shut off. And so I noticed that my numbers kept declining. Um, and so one of the things that I realized that Discord network was, was good for me was that Discord allows you to set up channels with little hashtags and they're private. So you're able to set up channels. And so I, I created a channel that was for memes Boy, they love that channel. I, I get so many memes. Uh, it also gives you the opportunity to do chats. So sometimes it was random chats that I would get and I, you know, based on our boundaries. So like, I'm going to be available this times and things like that, but I would go and look at these chats and I would look at these things. 
by creating these channels where they can talk to each other, kind of help me out, but also by creating a, a connection for, for, mo for, uh, for memes, for, for jokes or for this, but also a, a, I would post a resource page or a resource uh, hashtag. If you're feeling sad or blue, click me too. Uh, and so, you know, if you would click it and I would have all kinds of random stuff that I would put there. And the reason I liked the, the Discord app too was because they could get it on their phone. And so they were not, they didn't have to always be connected to the computer. Um, they were able to have the Discord. And I recently found out about Gather Town. But the cool thing about Gather Town is free for 25 and under. And you can build a little city that their little, uh, little avatar thing can move around the city. And so if you and I are talking right now, we're, we're, our little avatars are in front of each other in the living room or whatever it is we created, and um, we can talk. But if you move away from me, then you go somewhere else, my screen shuts off. And so they might connect with someone else in the room. So I created a little island and a little area outside. And so I would say, we're gonna meet outside for, for youth group. We're gonna be by the tree. And in reality, we're sitting here in front of a screen. And I don't know why, but this little thing of just going outside and sitting around a tree has sort of like raising a little more of, of, of togetherness. Um, then, and it's still the same thing. We're doing the same thing. We're in a little camera. But for some reason, something different, this little thing moving around, um, sort of gave us a little bit of surge. I'm really hoping we could get back in person, even if it's six feet apart in a parking lot where we could just toss a ball at each other. Even if we have, I mean, some of the kids said, can we just wear gloves and masks? And can we just wear a suit and can we just meet? Um, and, you know, and of course we're thinking maybe we should gloves and masks and go six feet apart in a parking lot because we just, we miss each other. We miss, we miss being in community. But these are some of the things that have, that have worked for us. Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. I played with Gather Town too, and it, it's fun. It's a little, it's just a different thing rather than seeing the Brady Bunch screen go by, um, which was old, you know, 30 years ago, and now is really old. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, another uh, question for you you know, if you could synthesize all of your experiences about safe and brave space into sort of one elevator speech answer, what would you say adults can do to create? those spaces for you? Be present. Be present because uh, I am often guilty of being on my phone. Okay, I'm often, I'm often guilty of being in the place or being in the space, but yet being on my phone. And I've often been guilty of being preoccupied with, with life, with the world. And that's what I said that my behind the scenes uh, team really helps out because I don't have to constantly be on. And when I'm with them, I'm really there. And um, that, that is the main thing. Because if there's anything that's lacking um, in their world is people who care enough to listen or who will give them the time of day. There's, there's some of them are so used to being sush and being thrown out or being asked to leave that you just counter balance that negativity and you counterbalance that loneliness with just being there. I love that. Thank you. A question about, about space again, you know, we can talk about this, but what are the, um, you know, you're in seminary right now, so this is sort of bread and butter these days. What biblical or uh, spiritual traditions showcase that? Um, is there something from our, from our history that we can draw upon to help us in these times and these, especially different times doing this online, but you know, a lot of the scriptures talk about creating brave and safe spaces. So is there anything that comes to mind for you on that? Well, I talk about Jesus in particular as, as a model for, for what I do, because when I think of of Jesus asking questions. Do you, do you wanna be healed? Do you wanna be, um, and also when I think of the margins, of being out in the margins, it sort of reminded me of why I even do what I do um, in particular. And where Jesus went wasn't a particular building, right? 
And so the space, the brave space or the space that we create and, and the places we want young people to be, of course, we want them to come to our church and we want them to be here and, and we want to create this. But the reality, especially in today, uh, a space, a sacred space, a sacred ground is literally out at, 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 a, at McDonald's, at Starbucks, outside, at, on a computer. Um, and so the church has looked different in this pandemic and it has really taught us and showed us how ministry originated and from the beginning and acts and all that, it was about out, right? And so there, I tell the, the students, there's a special day that we gather together. Um, of course, we don't have that right now, but I tell them there's still a special day that we gather together except you log in. Um, but there's other times where we can stay and be connected. So that's what has sort of guided me um, in my time with them in terms of, of biblical, biblical things. And of course, uh, young people are always, you know, all about so squishy and body fluids and they get grossed out by Jesus spitting in the mud. And, and, and so I also try to, to, to bring to the texture, the, the visuals of, of what some of that stuff is, some of the biblical stories that actually um, come to life, I guess I'd say. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Talk to me about your virtual church experience. Uh, that's, that's something that I am pretty unfamiliar with. And I'm curious what, uh, what that looks like and if youth ministry comes into play in that setting. Yes. Uh, First UCC Second Life is a real church uh, with real life standing in the Nevada Conference of the UCC. Um, and Second Life is a, a virtual platform where there's already a community in play. Uh, people actually spend real money to buy real retail and uh, real real estate, and they create these, um, these places. And so First UCC has a church there at, at an island, so it's awesome. Um, and in this space, we have uh, worship services. And so you have all these different avatars um, that come from all over the place. And one of the things that, um, that really sort of tested our sacraments and our, our, our theological understanding was baptism. So how do you baptize um, in, in, a, in a virtual church? And so what we did, there was a young man in Norway who is autistic, who doesn't like to be touched, who would have never showed up to the church, but because he's institutionalized and things like that, and he was baptized, his avatar was baptized on our church by him in real life, putting his hands in a bowl of water, his brother being a witness. At first UCC, his avatar was dunk. So he had a little dunking thing. And all these avatars from different places were his community of faith now. And so a person who would have normally not been baptized was baptized, was in the church. And, um, and in real life, he, he told us his name, he put his foot in the water. And so... Uh, it's a different, it's a complete different demographics. Um, it's a complete different uh, realm. Uh, but I also kind also call it uh, blind grace. So almost as if I was blind, and I am administrating, uh, and I am pastoring, and I am um, doing some pastoral care with someone I cannot see. Because the reality is that even though I can see their avatar, I, I don't know who this person really is in real life. And yet I'm offering grace, I'm offering a word, I'm offering um, pastoral care. We're, we're chatting sometimes, That's, sometimes they don't wanna use voice. Uh, and so, but we're doing all this. Um, so my little avatar would, and looks cooler than me. Um, and I also find out that it's cheaper to get ropes and things on Second Life, but it is, it is church. So I love it. It's its own brave and safe space, right? And as a pastor, also of a small church who has had to figure out how to do things like baptisms and funerals online, you're creating something that's uh, that you all have been doing in Second Life for a while. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Can you say a little more about the Day of Silence and how some of our viewers here might want to tap into a resource like that? So Day of Silence is, uh, it was created by LGBT youth who decided that one day out of the year, they were just gonna go completely silent. When it first started, uh, some of these kids were, um, they were bullied really bad. They were, they were thrown, um, they were thrown things. They, they used to use tape 
And so, as you know, tape hurts the lips, it dries the lips, it creates breathing problems and things like that. Um, but this has evolved because it came from kids, it came from young people. And so some of the grownups started, um, and I believe Glesson or Glad, one of them um, said, you know what, we're gonna do something to step in and help, uh, help them create a national day of silence. Uh, and so they created little cards that say, for today, I will be completely silent to bring awareness to, um, to the way we're being treated. Uh, some teachers um, and some administrators had a hard time with that. And so with Glesson stepping in, with Lambda Legal stepping in as well, um, some of the schools started to let them participate in this. And so, and so uh, started creating masks. Um, so now we use masks all the time, right? But, but they kind of came up with it. And so uh, they would decorate their masks and they would create um, a way of just being silent. And so as a church and as, as us standing with the oppressed and as us wanting to be practical with liberal theology and things like that. So how can we be a part of a movement that has nothing to do with us? For those who say that, right? Well, I, I'm, I have nothing to do with me, but how can I support that team or that group that does have a problem or that is going through those things? And so as a church, um, we might not be able to do a huge event like a prom or, or, or things like that, but we will, we might be able to, to go online to, to this website and log in and say, my church is a safe space, a brave space. And we are also going to be a part of this movement. Um, so we want to put on your database that we're here too. And we're also going to hold an event. Uh, and so what we did at our, our church is we hosted a pre day of silence. So we had markers and we, we came up with the masks and, and then we also were able to share them at school. So some of our youth was able to take stuff and, and give out. And then we hosted a breaking the silence party. And if you're able to connect with some GSA, some gay straight alliances at the school and say, hey, we wanna connect with you all uh, for a breaking the silence party. And we wanna host it. We wanna bring chips and drinks and we just want our youth to come and just take the mask out and scream up into the sky and just be like, be free. Uh, and it's just so liberating um, for our youth who were probably not a part of that community to literally, practically, theologically connect with that community and, and by, by, by coloring, by doing it. Of course, now we're all wearing masks, uh, but it, 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 was a really, it was a really cool thing. For Spirit Day, we asked our congregation to help us um, uh, do a sign that said, I am against bullying and a way that I support you is by... And so we, we had a booth, we put a purple uh, board and we had a camera. So our teens were taking photos. Uh, and so as the congregation was leaving on a Wednesday night, the, the uh, people would go and, and, and get a sign and say, I'm against bullying, I support you, bye. And all those photos then were placed all over the room in the youth room. And then we were able to share it. Um, this community supports you. Um, and, and it was just, it was beautiful. It's a beautiful way to connect the adults, the church, the greater church, but also a way to, to connect our youth with two events that really didn't cost us a lot, but yet showed us there. Which is sort of an interesting amalgam of building bridges that you talked about and creating the safe, brave space. It's really, really cool. We just have a couple of minutes left, so folks, last call on on questions. Um, but Yadi, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Any final words or remarks that you want to impart to us today? Even uh, after all these years of working with young people, I'm still learning. They, you know, they come up with all kinds of exciting things. Um, and I talked about how they find miraculously cell phones on the street. Um, <laughs> and how they do all kinds of things that you're just like, good God. But if there's one thing that I love about young people is their resilience. They're, they teach me that there's nothing I could do or have done or will do that keeps me away from God. And so if I can then mirror that and show them, then I feel that even though I'm not an expert, I, I, I do know how to listen and I do know how to just be present. And sometimes that, that's it, that's all you need. So if I could be of, of, of any service, of any help uh, to anyone, um, yeah, I'm here. Because I think that all of us can, there might be some things that I didn't think about that you have and, and vice versa. And, but that's how we build our network and stuff.